Hey, you all. Carpetbagger here, coming to you live from the north. More specifically, we are back in Portland, Maine. I'm actually on my way back, traveled up to Canada, and I'm driving back through Maine, and I was actually invited to uh, come back here to Portland, Maine, and visit Phillips Puppets. The owner, Austin, has invited me out here. He actually collects antique ventriloquist dummies and also repairs and restores antique ventriloquist dummies. So I'm very excited to see the collection that he has. So please, follow me. And here we go. Let's just take this in. Wow. Oh my goodness. Yeah, definitely a lot of eyes looking back at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this is kind of the front half of my collection. This is, uh, my name's Austin, by the way. I, I, I'm the owner and operator of Phillips Puppets. Uh, this is my fiance, Lily. She, uh, she helps me out once in a while in here as well. And uh, welcome to my to my nine to five, uh, this front. Oh, that's amazing. It, this is uh, this is my collection of antique puppets and figures that I've kind of amassed over my career. A lot of them are very sentimental to me. Um, you know, amazing relationships along the way I've built with fellow figure builders and performers to acquire this stuff, and uh, there's just so much into it. So, uh, but yeah, I love doing like hands-on show and tell. So let me show you some of the some of the interesting things that I have here if you want to take a look. Awesome. So uh, what I love about a lot of these ventriloquist dummies are the ability for these makers to market these in a way that's not just for ventriloquism. So a lot of these things are kind of, they don't really look like a dummy. They're actually like a novelty item. So this, for example, this is fully paper mache. Uh, and this is a, uh, this doesn't really make a lot of sense anymore, but back in the day in England, this was a, uh, this was like a home decoration. It was like a yeah. porcelain kind of thing. You still see them once in a while. But uh, this was made by this uh, guy named Len Insel Jr. He worked with his father, Len Insel Sr. in England, and he actually made uh, talking versions. Oh my God, of these. I wasn't even expecting <laughs> him to move. <laughs> exactly. And uh, it's controlled here on the back with these two triggers. And again, this is all handmade, it's all paper mache, all painted, and you, as you notice, if you're really paying attention, there's no lines on the side of the jaw. Yeah, yeah, I did notice that. So that's a piece of leather that folds. Leather, wow. Yeah, the English uh, the English style, they were really trying to make this more naturalistic approach to, to building it down. And this thing, I, I figured you would like this, um, this is kind of more up your alley, I think. This is like a very, very funky little guy here. This was called the Colonel. <laughs> the Colonel. And, and this was made to go on a cane. This was a cane talk. So it was like the top of a cane. That's exactly right. And he can, of course, talk. And, oh my gosh. And I love that. That makes me want to start using a cane <laughs> just so I can have a little <laughs> exactly. dummy I mean, head on top. I mean, it's just like, who would have thought of that ever? Like, <laughs> and it's just, it's so incredible. And so like, my life is going through these old catalogs that I find. This is a, this is the company Max Andrews. It's a magic shop. It was a magic shop in England. And this is the guy, and he supplied the the figures for it. So my life is trying to find, you know, the items out of this That's catalog. That's the, the floating skull. Yeah, absolutely. And we can try to make him float in a little bit. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> there's the colonel. There's the Toby jug. I would still love to find this cat. I have no the idea. Talky cat. I have no idea if they even made more than that one for the photo. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's just uh, keep kind of going along. So like I said, there was a there was a father and son team they kind of work together sometimes but the uh the father was kind of the driving force and uh this is one of his dummies and i'll oh. show you what he does <laughs> yeah head right off yeah exactly yeah uh so yeah again leather for for the moving mouth uh but watch you, you can see there's this whole cluster of movements here and uh let's see what he can do so his eyebrows raise talks of course uh he can do this little sneer oh wow wow let me see that and if you're really paying attention you'll so there's a hole there and thus you, you can uh you can insert a cigarette so he can so he can smoke exactly yeah. so a paper mache head with a cigarette probably not <laughs> <laughs> a great idea oh yeah that's insanely dangerous yeah uh he can turn to look of course uh, he winks he also blinks and again leather really beautifully applied the way that just kind of folds in the head and uh yeah it almost looks like like rubber or something that's what does. i thought at first exactly but. yeah um 
it's, it's kind of akin to the animatronics you see today that are all silicone. Um, what I love about him too, what's so unique too, he's got this feature that I really love. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, oh, wow. I mean, so much emotion and so much comedy in, in, the, in those movements. It's just, it's just a brilliant piece. And again, every single component made by hand. He even made the eyeballs out of glass stink bombs and they were just clear and he would punch a piece of leather and put it in the eye and that's backed with plaster pairs to make the white. So this guy literally, this was a complete passion project for this man. And every single component made by hand, he turned the head sticks, he made all the intricate mechanisms. Uh, let me show you, speaking of intricate mechanisms, if he doesn't mind, I'll take his head off here and I can show you kind of what I'm talking about. So they're beautiful works. Do all, do all their heads just come off that easy? <laughs> some do, some don't. These, okay. these ones kind of do. I never realized you could just like pop their heads off. <laughs> exactly, it's not normally what you'd ever think. But if we look at the back here, I hope you can see with the lighting. But oh, to yeah. kind of give you an idea of some of the inner plumbing of these things, kind of how they work. And all of these, again, all these parts made by hand, cut and soldered together, steel. Um, just an incredible effort to make something. Yeah. Uh, and he made over 2,000 of these things in his life, and it wasn't his full-time job. He made animated window displays for Christmas and that sort of thing. He was also a stage magician, uh, but he also happened to make uh, a whole bunch of the most beautiful, gorgeous-looking pieces of artwork that I had ever seen. So I feel incredibly lucky that I get uh, a, original examples of his artwork around me at all times. It really That's energizes amazing. me and uh, brings a smile to my face. Um, little bits and pieces by past makers of uh, of old, people have influenced me, hands, eyeballs, ears, you name it, we've got it. Little bits and pieces of little bits and pieces. gummies in there. Exactly, and up here on the top, these are some of my favorite puppets. So these are called uh, Punch and Judy style. Yeah, puppets. yeah, Punch and yeah, Judy. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of disappearing in America, but it's, it's still pretty strong over in Europe. But so these were made in Chicago in the 30s by uh, George and Grace Pinksy Larson. That's actually an original flyer for their show. So they are some of my favorite builders because they have such a, a folk art Americana look to them. Yeah, absolutely. And again, these were made in the 1930s, so there's nothing else that really looks like it. Um, but what's really interesting, so he was a, a tattooed man in the circus. He was a magician. He was a wood carver. And he was a Punch and Judy man. And Grace was a pianist uh, and a puppeteer. And she had... Um, a birth defect that left her with the ability to only use one hand but so he carved all the heads and then she painted and dressed them and I actually have a photo of them uh, to kind of show you how cool this one will look my little drawer here of a hundred thousand different things but that's the couple there and I just I think it's such oh, a, wow. an interesting looking couple and if I could be a fly <laughs> on the wall for a conversation I would absolutely <laughs> love to I mean quite the family photo no kids but I guess that would suffice for the kids in the children, back of the photo yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, just an absolute uh, amazing duo team that kind of supplied a lot of the ventriloquists around the turn of the century. And then you kind of fast forward a little bit, we hit vaudeville. We're kind of at the same time, 20s, 30s, that era. Um, this is one of my favorites as well. So, uh, you know, he kind of almost looks like a vampire, but the reason for that was, you know, this is original vaudevillian paint from yeah. 1922, I think was the date on him. All carved out of wood. And uh, let me, I can take his head off as well. Uh, so we're gonna take it off just so I can kind of show you. And this one, you know, complete contrast from the other figures, very simple, just a moving mouth, but more American style. And when I say that, I mean the slots on the side of the jaw, nice big wide opening, and that's a piece of leather underneath the chin to kind of hide that jaw dropping down in. Um, but so famously, this was carved by uh, a gentleman named Charlie Mack, who famously carved Charlie McCarthy for Edgar Bergen. Yeah. So those of you know who puppets are, that sort of thing, <laughs> Charlie McCarthy, carved by the same maker, and he was actually carved the same year as Charlie. So really? it's very possible that, that you know this kind of saw some of the workings of Charlie on the bench. I mean, maybe, oh, that's, maybe that's just kind of a romantic idea I have. <laughs> uh, but I love him because he's original. He he has a lot of the elements that Charlie had. And again, I love that it's, it's a real time capsule. It shows you what entertainment was in the 20s and 30s. This was an approach to make something very visual, really sharp carved features. These guys were originally furniture makers. They weren't puppet makers, but they adapted their skills to making puppets. So was the white skin just to show up better on stage? Exactly right, yeah. So my guess would be with um, whatever the gas lighting at the time or that, that famous limelight sort of look, I think this would have blended. And again, with these music halls, you're at a far, far distance. So the things you want to pop are the eyes and the mouth. So 
We have dark eyebrows with a glass eye that makes it gleam, but we also have this giant, wide, big red mouth. And so that's kind of where that dummy's got that red lipstick from. So anytime you <laughs> see sense. one of those, like Groucho Marx or something in a store, and you're like, why are the rips like lips like fire engine red? That's why it's kind of a tradition uh, for these puppets. But uh, we'll put him back in here, and um, this is something I made. I don't have a ton of examples of my own work, but uh, I do build full-time. This is my full-time job, uh, and this is a novelty. Like I was showing you with that Toby jug, I kind of wanted my own um, novelty item as well. So I'm a big Halloween guy, as you can tell. Oh, and so, <laughs> so <cool. laughs> we have this talking jack-o'-lantern, and uh, let me show you how he operates inside there. Again, you can kind of, hopefully that shows up on yeah, camera. Okay. Yeah, the inner workings there. It's controlled underneath with these two controls. And uh, that lid actually is on magnets as well. So when you're performing, you don't have to worry about it toppling off and rolling into the audience. <laughs> but uh, I don't really have a voice for him, but I, I really think uh, I think he really kind of captures what I love about Halloween and that, oh, yeah, that vibrancy that. and, that, and that, that playfulness about it. Um, love that. Very fun piece. This guy's really exciting too. Again, he was made by Lennon Soul Jr., but this is actually uh, an, what you would call back then an animatronic figure. This was a coin-operated figure for an arcade game. Oh, okay. It's called Sydney Nose, uh, and it was a fortune teller. And basically, uh, this was really bare bones. It's not as exciting as the stuff you'd see today, but you'd put your, your penny in at the time, slide it in, and he has a uh, moving mouth, he has eyebrows that raise up, his ears would flap, and then the eyes turn as well. Um, and then this is the cam setup that would all make all that magic happen. It'd be connected to some wires down below and there'd be an electric motor that spins this camshaft and all of those triggers move making the facial animations. But uh, exceedingly rare piece, I was, I was so lucky to find that. And I just love the simplicity of the outfit. It's just, it's, it's basically just felt cut and pasted and then a big old nail to put the bow tie <laughs> in. And again, just paper mache and uh, just a really fantastic piece. I think it's um, super exciting to look at every day. And one day I'll actually have the cabinet finished to uh, put him back together the way he was in his glory. Um, but yeah, and as you can see, like I said, I'm a big Halloween guy, so I've got a uh, big collection of antique Halloween stuff, got some of the old German die cut skeletons. Um, those of you who love Halloween know that this stuff is getting crazier and crazier every year, and Halloween is just growing. So it's really exciting for me uh, to be into that holiday, but be living in a time where it's really, really making a resurgence um, and really just growing, because it allows me to kind of make fun things like that yeah, pumpkin, yeah, yeah. And, find this sort of stuff to decorate with. And, um, oh, here's one of my little guys as well. This is, uh, this is one of my own figures, and this is kind of my attempt at making something that's sort of modern classic. So, again, he has the dark lips and the dark eyes, but a little bit more refined, a little bit more sophisticated. Yeah, that's right. Who's he? Oh, he, he's our guest, okay? He's our guest. I don't like him. No, you, you don't, don't like me. I, I'm sorry, I'm putting him down. <laughs> I don't like it. I'm putting him down. Don't worry about it. I'm sorry about that, everybody. But yeah, that's one of my little guys. Uh, I call him my, uh, he's one of my punchline pals. And uh, it's an affordable option. That's a high quality professional figure, but at a beginner price point. So that was kind of my uh, passion project for the past couple of years at making something uh, that didn't sacrifice any quality for the price point and something obtainable by most people and with a different wig and a paint job it can be a whole new character so it's so it's really versatile um but let me take you into the workshop where all the magic happens. okay come on and follow me where all the magic happens uh, i've got a bunch of parts and pieces and heads yeah, and all the all different this. stages here um this is kind of these are some interesting figures again made by that same maker but for coin op machines that i just finished restoring They've got weighted eyes. Oh, he's like bobbles on the, exactly, the yeah. spring. Yeah, and so the premise behind this machine, it was called a crybaby, and it's a dad holding this infant that won't stop crying. I think, <laughs> I think I've actually seen yeah. this machine. Is it maybe, I'm trying to think back, is it uh, in San Francisco? Yes, that's at exactly right. Museum Mechanique? That's exactly right, yeah, exactly. So they made quite a few of these, and um, yeah, luckily these are uh, really cool pieces that I was able to, to fix up and restore, and um, yeah, that's exactly right. So they're still around and they're still working, and it's just amazing what entertainment used to be. It was yeah. you pay to watch something kind of bobble. <laughs> that was it? And uh, there's something really magical about that. Um, this is again one of my creations. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, in the primer stage, so it's uh, it's not going to be this color. I promise you. I don't make ice cream cones that are flesh tone. <laughs> 
I'm not really interested in human ice creams. Uh, but let me show you what he can do. So he talks, of course. Aww. The eyes are weighted, and then if he doesn't like it, blah, tuck, tuck. <laughs> It's amazing. Thank you very much. And that's just operated with one lever on the back. Uh, pull it down and then past that point the tongue injects. So that's a favorite here that we love to make. And um, yeah, again, I just love that that, that old retro kind of, um, you know, advertisement look that you saw in the 30s and 40s. I really wanted to, I really wanted to have something like that in one of my puppets that you can actually get. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and again, one of my little guys here that's in progress, kind of show you just kind of the inner workings of how these things get started. The eyebrow movement here on these springs, bang, 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 bang. The eyes move side to side. Uh, and again, too, I use that um, traditional method of applying leather to make the mouth work. Okay, so you still use the little leather? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So uh, not on every figure, it definitely depends on the character and, and uh, what you're trying to do, but so. For this one, I wanted to kind of have that old British feel, so we stuck with the leather, and um, that's a process that took me many years to kind of master, and I traveled all over the world uh, learning with some of the best makers of my generation to kind of learn these trade secrets. So this is something that runs deep. It's not something I just kind of- <laughs> Figured out? Yeah, fell into. <laughs> Looked up on YouTube? Yeah, you can. I wish you could have. <laughs> it would save me a lot of time. Uh, this you'll probably know too, so similar to Laugh and Sal, that big old one. Oh yeah, that's my favorite, Laugh yeah. and Sal. So this is the Laughing Sailor. Okay, I've seen him too, yeah. yeah exactly, I think oh, wow. San Francisco has. San Francisco has one too, I think they have one at, uh, what's it, uh, Marvin's yeah. Mechanical Museum. Yeah, and, uh, I still haven't been to Marvin's, Michigan. I'm dying to go. I it's really fun, really fun. Yeah, exactly, so again, I, I'm really lucky that, especially right now, that I've got such significant pieces that I was able to fix. Oh, there he is, the, the Laughing Sailor without, now strip down to his <laughs> bare components. It's weird to see him when he's not laughing. I know. <laughs> and uh, this is a this is actually one of mine in my collection. This is a uh, it's in process of being restored right now, so you'll have to pardon the appearance. But um, this was marketed as a breast pocket figure, so this was meant to actually sit <laughs> in here and the head bobble. Just walk around with a yeah, little little it, man in your pocket. The life of the party, right? <laughs> Come to the Christmas party with this thing, and you're not gonna have the lady stop talking to you. I promise. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so he's a really, really fun piece, and I, again, it just speaks to the imagination of the, these artists and the creatives. I think a lot of times that um, you know, uh, the idea of a ventriloquist dummy is very black and white, and it is what it is. But um, these were working, brilliant, talented artists making Absolutely. things to the best of their abilities, and I think that some of the stuff is just so imaginative and fun, and uh, I love that I get to be a part of kind of carrying that on and kind of just coming up on their shoulders into a new generation of figure making and trying to keep what was old new again and just, um, yeah, trying to make people smile. This stuff is supposed to be fun and it, it's supposed to be goofy and uh, I absolutely love it. Uh, but yeah, so all my molds are in here. Not very exciting, but definitely kind of the, you can see the chaos of my life a little bit. <laughs> uh, but these are all uh, silicone molds. I can show you an example. Um, so like that pumpkin I showed out here. Okay. Um, how I make it is I cast it from this mold that I've created that was from a clay bust. So as you can see there's kind of the negative of the pumpkin. Okay. And that's uh, silicone rubber. And I prime that mold and then I cast the positive medium out of that and then I pull it out and mechanize it and paint it and then you got yourself a puppet. That's it in a nutshell. Um, but sometimes, you know, a lot of people ask me do I wood carve these things and I originally started by carving them all out of wood but once I kind of ramped up production I got more into the mold making process uh, just because you could kind of expedite things and do more of one thing and this is like a mold in progress kind of kind of the nature of the beast you brush the silicone on and let it dry and build up layers um, but yeah let's go back in there and have some more fun with some other stuff awesome so, what's this old skeleton yeah so yeah. this yeah this was um you know it was so funny so I love these old dark rides and that sort of thing and I was on a I, first of all, I wanted an old coffin, so I drove all the way to Connecticut to get this thing, despite what Lily wanted me to do. <laughs> and, uh, no, but she's wonderful, and she really uh, supports my, my passions. And uh, so I got this coffin, but I needed a really great skeleton to put in it, and I loved these old dark red skeletons that were kind of funky and wonky, and they weren't just the Home Depot skeletons yeah. you could buy. Um, so I remember when I was a kid at iParty, they used to have these latex skeletons, and I was like, I mean, I must have been six. But I still remember it like it was yesterday. So literally a few years ago, I was on a hunt for this thing. And it's insane. I had to go all the way to, well, I didn't have to go. I had to buy it from England and ship it in really? because they just don't make them anymore. Because uh, they kind of perish and get all weird. 
Uh, but that's what I like about it. It's 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 this it's this kooky kind of creepy thing, and uh, I think it just kind of fits there well. Um, the same with these old jack lanterns. I forget what company made these rubber ones, but they yeah, just got really these cool. really killer faces on them. And uh, yeah, I just I just love when people were making kooky stuff for Halloween. It just made the holiday so much fun. I'm gonna try one of the one of the dummies here. The dummy dummy is the the correct. Yeah, you know, I don't think they mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dummies, puppets, whatever you want to call them. Uh, hey, let's give you this guy. Let's give you the, okay. the whole, he's all, he's not just a floating head. So, so we do a hand in the back and then uh, on this controller here, uh, that does the mouth. Okay. And then there's kind of a side to side rocker up and down for the eyes. I don't think I've ever done this before. <laughs> it's the first time for everything. There he goes. I think I just broke him, I'm sorry. I don't think you did, I think he's totally good. <laughs> Oh, you're totally good. Oh, I think the knot slipped. I think today is like here. Let me. Fix it real quick. <laughs> oh, no. it Apparently, I'm very poor. I'm very, I'm very poor. Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> all right, that's an easy fix. One, oh, okay. Two, Woo. No, you're good. Oh my god, I never want you to think. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Luckily, I know a guy who can fix them. There we go. So I can just do whatever I want. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There you go. Take two. All right, we take can, two. We can edit that one. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Let's see what else we can get him. You got the eyes. Eyes. And the mouth. There we go. How do you... <laughs> this is a ridiculous question, but... No, no, no. How do you talk without moving your mouth? You kind of try to figure out substitutes for the hard letters. So, um, I kind of just clench my teeth together. And so a good exercise I like to say is try to say peanut butter, which is a hard word to say without moving your lips. So if you substitute P with T-H. Peanut and, butter. And butter with T-H as well. But say T-H, but think P and B. So peanut butter. Peanut butter. <laughs> Perfect. I want a peanut butter sandwich. There we go. <laughs> so top notch. And you, you, put them, you put them on your knee? Either that... or. Yeah, yeah. He's a little smaller in size, so you could work them uh, holding or on the knee. A lot of performers use stands now, just sort of like a mic stand with yeah. a flat top on it. Hey, Harry, honey. I want a peanut butter sandwich. There we go. <laughs> That's so great. Look at that. <laughs> Oh yeah, you hold on, you have to do the, um, so every professional ventriloquist has their promo shots taken, hold the dummies looking at you like this. Like you just, he just said something. Oh, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, you dummy? <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of traditional, don't they have kind of like an adversarial relationship? Absolutely, yeah, they yeah. never get along, yeah. And then the dummy's always like really rude and snarky. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> This could be your opportunity to change the game. Yeah, this may just become a ventriloquist channel from here on out. <laughs> I think you need to do dark rides with the dummy. Oh my god. Dark rides with the dummy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because you know, I'm always talking to myself, so I could just end up like, have the dummy with me while, uh, and he could chat with me while I'm on the dark rides. This sure is a scary dark ride, dummy. You're telling me. I hope we can get a Peanut butter sandwich after this. <laughs> I love it. Oh wow. Gosh. Okay. There you go. So we got the the pumpkin here. There we go. Oh, I love that. Happy Halloween, everybody. Let me see. You clench your teeth. Did you try to close your lips? You can, yeah, if you want Happy to Happy Halloween, everybody. There we go. Big paper mache head if you okay, want Okay, so we got a... There you go, try it on for size. Oh. There we go. <laughs> He's like a policeman? I guess so, yeah. It sort of looks like Porky Pig versus mixed with a policeman. <laughs> Actually, this works like this, because if this covers my mouth. Happy Halloween, everybody! Hey, everyone! I'm a giant policeman. This is my friend, Mr. Pumpkin. Hello, policeman! <laughs> there we go. This is my new act. I love it. 
It's got, okay, so it's like a paper skeleton, but actually yeah. it's a pendulum like a clock. Yeah, that was made in, uh, with the Beistel company in the 50s. And um, again, I think we, I really want us to get back to Halloween props that are like this, because this was something that cost a few dollars and it's a uh, endless laugh. Yeah, I love them. Like the old, like, uh, like paper skeletons, yeah. I think are so, so classic. They, they really are. They, there's just something that you can't, you can't duplicate it now with big plastic things. I mean, who, like, what in the right mind? Who designed this? It's crazy looking. <laughs> like, who thought of that? <laughs> it's just insane. And you know, this is when the holiday is in its infancy, so it's really developing its own style. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, I guess this is where they're kind of like feeling out the, uh, yeah. what Halloween is going to look like. Exactly. Black cats, and then in America, they start making these, these pulp lanterns. You know, these are just made out of like uh, egg carton material basically. This one's two-sided. Oh wow. Don't really know why that makes sense, but I guess it makes <laughs> sense. Does it have two expressions or? Uh, it, it, two different faces a two. little bit. Yeah. Um, it's funny enough, this, this face, <laughs> if any of you out there watch Adventure Time, there's this one scene with a cow in the woods that has an udder and there's a face on the udder and it looks just like this. Oh my god. <laughs> And then what about this lobster here? Yeah, that lobster was bought from a marionette troupe in England. <clears throat> and being in Maine, I thought, what better home than having it here? <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's fully articulated. I won't try to move him too much because I think uh, a blizzard of dust would fall off him. <laughs> and uh, But yeah, he's completely wood carved. Like I said, he was used in England. And uh, yeah, I saw him for sale, a friend of mine. Um, was kind of liquidating this marionette troops of sting and I was able to get that and uh, yeah and I think it's super cool that they even if you look closer they even glued on a googly eye there we go <laughs> <laughs> uh, and of course you need a you know Louis the largemouth bass anytime you're making your oh, own okay. kind of shop or living space you need the fish on a plaque of course <laughs> you can't do without and then of course we've got skeletons everywhere I'm obviously a very big fan of these old skeletons so I I've got them every which way you look. I just noticed this down here. What is that, right? The crocodile? Is that a, a crocodile? Yeah, like pull them out. <clears throat> so this is a paper mache crocodile for a Punch and Judy show made by Arthur Quisto from England. Oh, wow. And uh, let me get him out here. It's very scary, actually. So I guess it does its job. Oh, goodness. Isn't that insane? That is. But um, those amazing. of you who might know Punch and Judy, it's a pretty fast paced. Uh, quick action. It's like sort very of violent, punch. right? <laughs> and using paper mache to smack, I mean, that's why he's completely uh, distressed. I mean, you would never in a thousand years want a paper mache fragile thing being smashed <laughs> up. Makes no sense. So is it is like Punch of Judy stuff hard to find because they're all smashed to pieces? It is, yeah. Like, great example. These guys, these were made by the Pinksies as well, but you can see, like, it's been smashed and repainted and smashed and, like, cheek glued back on. <laughs> You know, <laughs> so uh, I think I love those ones because they kind of show their battle scars really well. Uh, but yeah, he's a he's a, he's a great great uh, piece. Of, I like this one too because it looks like a looks like an old theater prop almost. Yeah. This sort of transcends a, a puppet and it looks like something you'd find in the storage unit of your local theater. Um, <laughs> yeah, just amazing. This is actually this is a, a, one of my favorite pieces. So there was a, a a builder named Frank Marshall in Chicago who came after the Max and. Um, so all of his dummies were carved out of wood, but to save time, he did a process called duplicarving puppets, which was essentially like an antique CNC machine. So this was a blank head that he would use and put on the machine to carve out um, future dummies to carve, and this came out of his workshop, and I just think it's a... It looks like really artistic because it's really stained dark. It shows all like the laminating. Like this looks like some weird art deco piece you'd see in a yeah. gallery or no, something. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of ghostly too, obviously. With the, with the hollow movie. eyes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, that's sort of a birth of a dummy when you're making them out of wood. And uh, again, too, just being able to find this stuff along the way is very special to me and very exciting because this is nobody ever a thinks of a dummy. They don't think about who built the dummy, and they don't think about the tools to build the dummy. But I think about all three. <laughs> <laughs> this was a push for a novelty puppet, but also to make something super portable. So this kind of is the brainchild of a ventriloquist puppet meeting a Punch and Judy puppet. So you've got hands oh, okay. that can slap, but his eyes are on weights inside the head and he talks as well. 
So this is like the ultimate portable ventriloquist dummy. And uh, I think he's kind of funky. Oh, you that wave. That's, that's <laughs> Jacob. Oh, I like him. Yeah, he likes you. Okay, good. Oh, good. this one yeah. likes me. That's yes, good. Yeah, take him out. Take him out. Come on, take him out. <laughs> but yeah, he's just, again, a quirky, fun little thing. And uh, I just love him. I think the, the flimsiness of it is just, it's, it's hysterical. Uh, really, really funky little thing. Uh, your more stereotypical Punch and Judy puppets, these were carved by a guy named Fred Tickner out of England. I really love these because uh, they're very they're very decorative, though. The glossy colors and the reds, they really look kind of very Christmassy to me. They're very, very, uh, they're very approachable. They're very cute. I really like them. And um, just, again, the right amount of handmade, very painterly. You see all the brush strokes, you see all the imperfections, but it really just kind of adds a lot of character to these things. And um, they actually work really well, too. So from a performer standpoint, that's a great set of working puppets because a lot of times these things they're not made by professionals and they're kind of they kind of fall short and uh, during the test of actually making these things work and well this one looks like Freddie Mercury or something it's really <laughs> really bizarre this was carved by uh, Foy Brown who made these really interesting puppets and ventriloquist dummies and even his dummies all look like this they had all those real dramatic eyelashes and theatrical lines and um, again it just speaks to that artist and and their idea of being creative and it's 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 this is really true folk art this is like just a an american guy making something to the best of his abilities in the way that he thinks looks good and that's why i like it yeah. um you know these things always kind of remind me of um what's that carnival game with the the charlie's hat that you knock the hat off and they have these big old wooden heads that go around and you have to knock yeah knock their hats yeah, off yeah these like carvings kind of remind me of those a little bit um and like the judy as well oh let's get the metal that the devil? Yeah. The devil was like always a constant theme in the shows. It was kind of uh, it was kind of the reminder to Mr. Punch about sin. And uh, <laughs> there's also a ghost in the show, which was supposed to be kind of his conscious. So it's a lot of moral lessons in the show. But also they were just puppets to put up on stage and hit with a stick and get a laugh. <laughs> and then put your hat out and make 10 cents and go mm. home. A real basic sculpture. This was made by Arthur Quisto in the 30s out of England. Nothing, ex yeah, very, very sneaky a little upper lip there, which is a little scary, <laughs> got to admit. Uh, moving jaw, of course. His other movements are a little stiff. And what was funky back then was so all the heads were flat on the bottoms of the neck. And yeah. a lot of you are wondering why does that even make sense. Well, modern ones, like mine, they kind of a rounded neck so they can kind of fit into a socket and roll around. These heads were more just spinning. And so his idea to make a head turn down, which I think is hysterical, it would have been a spring. There's a bit of elastic yeah. there now. But so the head can nod. So oh, so like, just like, yeah, like it's, rocked it's, it forward? It's, yeah, really interesting. So the performer would have it on the body as he looked down there and he could look down and then look back at me kind of thing. So it's just, it's a weird, it's a weird part in the event building history of just trying to evolve more movement in a dummy and again, basic kind of sculpture of the face, but what I think Arthur Quisto did brilliantly was his use of color really creates the shape of the head. Uh, and again, I think What's cool about his stuff is it, it looks more antique and old than it is. Like, it's old. It's 1930s, but this looks like something that could have been from 1692 or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know? like, so, the, uh, so these figures are really appealing to, to, to art collectors and ventriloquists alike just because of that. But again, too, I, I'm trying to always find examples that are uh, they kind of explain how we got to where we are now and the evolution of how this craft developed and different makers' ideas. And um, again, yeah, just a special piece. Uh, I absolutely love. This is about as crude and simple as it gets, but that's kind of why I love it. And this was made by a guy in Florida named William Kirk Brown, who really just offered super cheap paper mache dummies. Yeah. Like, and but just I, one string you pull. That's it. That's it, man. Just one. It's missing the stick. It would have had a stick on it and a trigger. But again, this is and this is like unlike the other ones with leather. This is a piece of canvas, just painted. But again, just it's so simple. There's nothing to it. But again, this was a guy who was just making them in his backyard on his patio and having fun, and I just love that it's, it's again, it's just that, it's that idea of folk art, and it's just, uh, it just oozes that. I really like, I like having him around. He's, he's a funny looking guy. <laughs> <laughs> Standard looking dummy there, but again, very theatrical with the eyelashes and the painting, and very, again, very American folk art sort of look to it. Uh, not afraid to show all the carving that went into this thing, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't a big fan of sandpaper, I don't think, because <laughs> uh, you can see it. But it, again, it kind of just adds to the charm of the, this puppet. So uh, headed to the bunker. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, thank you so much. I very well. absolutely love it. You're very welcome. Oh my god, I love him so much. So 
So a big thank you to uh, Austin for inviting me out to his studio. Thank you so much for my amazing jack lantern there. Oh, I love, I love his smile. So yeah, absolutely fascinated by the ventriloquist dummies, the restoration there. I even saw some of the uh, the automatons from the uh, coin out machines that I've come across on my journeys. But we're not quite finished for today because uh, I think it's time to go on another troll hunt. Headed into New Hampshire. And as we cross over this bridge, we find ourselves in the state of Vermont. And greeting us here to the state of Vermont, we have a uh, big boy on top of the Dairy Joy here. Looks like he has abandoned his burger that he normally holds aloft and is simply waving at people as they go by. And we have landed here in the town of South Londonderry, Vermont, a teeny tiny town here in Vermont. And we are here to try to locate another one of Thomas Dambo's trolls. If you've been following along with the channel, I have been uh, trying to see all the Thomas Dambo troll sculptures in the United States. They are giant massive trolls, maybe an artist named Thomas Dambo who makes them out of recycled materials. A lot of times we'll make them out of old wooden pallets and uh, he has built them different installations around the country. Some of them are in clusters. Some of them are lonesome trolls by themselves. Uh, we're currently looking for a troll by the name of Lost Finn here in uh, Vermont. Uh, Thomas Dambo is currently on a United States road trip. He is traveling from the East Coast to the West Coast and building trolls all along the way. Just uh, Probably a week or so ago, I went out to New Jersey and saw a brand new troll by the name of Big Rusty, who was made out of an abandoned, uh, an abandoned shop of some sort. That was so cool. He was one of my favorite trolls that I found. But now we're going to be trying to find Lost Finn here in South London, Derry, uh, Vermont. I've driven about. So I left Portland about three and a half hours ago. Drove straight here because I wanted to uh, be able to uh, see if I could find the troll with uh, where we still have some uh, sunlight. So uh, let's go see if we can find Lost Finn. The best way to find the trolls is to go to www.trollmap.com where uh, Thomas Dambo puts the locations of all the trolls. And let's see here if there's, a, there's an option to show where I'm at. Let's see if that, there we go. So there, there I am, and there is a troll. Let's zoom in. We have this troll here called Lost Finn, the brand new troll here in Vermont. So I'll check the, um, you can see, it doesn't say, you know, it doesn't notate exactly where he is. I'm gonna try to match up the river there on Google Maps, as well as where these streets are, and see uh, if I can get to that area, and then this should actually, um, you should actually use the, the map, because it should show, yeah, it'll show where I am in relation to the troll. So uh, let's go see if we can find Lost Finn. Right, this is uh, not a very big town, so it shouldn't be too hard to find. We'll head down this way. It doesn't look like it's near anything in particular, just kind of on a, uh, back road so okay I think we're near this is a uh, good sign here you see the birdhouses of course Thomas Dambo kind of known for making birdhouses before he made the trolls he would actually make birdhouses out of recycled materials and hand them out to people to put up all over the world so I think Lost Finn may be nearby also there's an entire parking lot full of cars parked here I guess they're all possibly they're all here to see uh, to see Lost Finn see another birdhouse there on top of the pole 
And then it says no street parking anywhere. This creates a safety hazard. If the lot is full, please come back another time. The troll will still be here. All right, so I'm pretty sure the troll is here. You see this rocky road up here. I did hear that there was some bad flooding here just a few weeks ago. So it looks like this road was uh, torn up in the flood, but we'll uh, keep walking and uh, hopefully we'll come across the troll. So yeah, there usually is a little bit of walking involved with finding the trolls. Um, he kind of likes to hide them away and make people hike to find them. That's one of kind of his main uh, main goals with the trolls. Um, I know one thing he does like to promote, you know, making the trolls out of, um, you know, recycled materials. He's trying to promote kind of an ecological message, but he also likes the idea that he uses the trolls to get people to get out of their house and go for a hike. And, whoo, going straight uphill here. This is, this is a little bit of a hike. So we round the corner here. Still no, still no troll. Okay, there's, there's some signs over there that say do not enter. So I think it must be this way. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see some birdhouses up there. So I guess we're supposed to follow, follow the birdhouses. Yeah, past definitely starting to get a little, little muddy here because of the recent flood eggs. So we'll do our best to uh, not get stuck in the mud here. Luckily, I got my uh, my hiking boots on. Yeah, you can see the the road's been like partially washed away there. another convergence in the paths but this birdhouse is pointing that way yeah I must say of all the trolls that I found of, of Thomas Dambo this is probably the longest hike it's pretty much straight uphill it's muddy it's rocky but uh, hopefully it'll be worth it can't give up hope now got some birdhouses here Letting us know that uh, Lost Finn is somewhere up ahead. Every time I start losing hope, I see another birdhouse beckoning me towards the troll. Whew. Oh, where are you, Lost Finn? I fear that he may have gotten lost. Yeah, occasionally the trail will fork, but uh, the birdhouses will keep you on track. All right, and I think we have finally made it. You can see Lost Finn there through the branches. And here he is, Lost Finn. See on his staff there, he actually has a birdhouse on the staff as he's been spreading birdhouses all through the forest. Closer look there at his face. You can see he actually has a, a piercing there through his nose. Almost sad, stoic look on his face. Up here and, uh, and touch his foot. You can kind of smell wood's been freshly, freshly cut. Uh, they say there's a sign that says not to crawl on Big Finn and not to crawl on the rocks here, so we certainly will respect that. See, he's kind of built on this uh, little outcropping of rocks here. Stomping. You could stomp me. You could stomp me if you wanted to, but 
I have a feeling that this is a kind-hearted troll that would not that would not stomp me to death. Two lost fed. Also a ladder of some sort over here. I don't know if this helps him uh, put up the uh, birdhouses. I know I've probably mentioned this a few times in this video, but this is a pretty, pretty difficult hike. I don't know. It's I don't know if it's a difficult, but it's 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 intense. This is this is I would say as far as troll hunts go, this is an advanced level troll hunt. I was not I didn't know what to expect. I thought he might just be off the side of the road. Some of the trolls closer to the rolls. Um, Isaac Hartstone is like a like a half mile, quarter mile hike. It's fairly flat, but no, you want to get to to Lost Fin, you, you're gonna have to walk. So be prepared if you come out here looking for Lost Fin. Prepare to uh, to go on a hike and, and 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 take the necessary precautions. Although it does make sense, I, I do definitely understand why he's called Lost Fin because. Uh, he definitely has gotten himself lost here in the woods of Vermont. I guess putting up birdhouses as he traveled through the woods and got himself a little bit lost. But it's okay to get lost every once in a while, isn't it, Finn? So it is time to head back down to leave the forest. Fortunately, fortunately, uh, it was all the way uphill on the way up, so by that reasoning, it should be all the way downhill on uh, on the way back. There is a lot of mosquitoes out here too by uh, by uh, Lost Fin, so maybe wear some repellent if you come out here. But uh, I, I'll save you guys the agony of having to listen to me huff and puff on my way uh, down the hill. But uh, thank you so much for coming uh, coming along with me. I really do love uh these these trolls and uh, i've been trying to do my best to uh to uh hunt them down there's a few i've not found there's one i think down in southern florida that i've missed there's one in wyoming that i've missed and then he is currently building new ones i think there's going to be i think he built one in uh, another one in colorado very recently he's actually doing vlogs right now talking about the work he's doing on the uh the uh, way of the the bird king so uh you can kind of follow along with his building I, I i would try to catch up with him but i have so much other things to do i don't want to show up i probably don't want to show up and bother him while he's trying to uh to do the work but uh, also i think there i heard i heard possibility that it looks like there's maybe a new one in um the upper peninsula of michigan as well and i think um in, uh, I think in Washington State, I think he's going to build a whole bunch of them when he gets out there. So I will, I will keep hunting these trolls and keep locating them when I, when I can, when I'm in the area. Hopefully, you guys enjoy that too. Leave a comment in the comment section. Do you enjoy the troll hunt? Do you enjoy uh, looking for these uh, Thomas Dambo trolls as we go out on our journey? Just leave a comment, letting me know in the comment section. And thank you so much for watching. Hey, if you watched to the end of the video, give a shout out to Lost Finn out here in the woods of Vermont. If you like these videos, please subscribe. I travel around the country. I film roadside attractions, amusement parks, museums, haunted houses, and other fun, random stuff. Also, big thanks to Austin today for letting me go into his uh, ventriloquist studio. It was really an amazing experience. Really cool to be up close and personal with those uh, antique ventriloquist dummies. It was a really unique and amazing experience. Hey, and if you need, if you're looking to buy a ventriloquist dummy or you need a ventriloquist dummy restored, please, please, uh, please contact Austin at uh, Philip Puppets. I'm sure he will Phillips puppets and he will uh, do some great work for you uh, If you like these videos, please subscribe. I think I already said that If you'd like to support the channel consider contributing to patreon three dollars or more We'll get you a postcard once a month from me to you also selling enamel pins in the Etsy shop and uh, Doing personalized messages on cameo birthdays anniversaries 
or just, you know, just because. Any, any occasion you'd like, check the description of this video if you're interested in that. And of course, all these things help keep, oh, so many mosquitoes, help keep this train on the track, this boat in the water, and this birdhouse high in the tree. Till next time, my friends. This one's in the bag.